let's welcome Caroline Wonga. Where's my first slide? Oh, there it comes. Do that. Look, John. Look up there. It's a mindset. Y'all ain't right, you ain't right. It was a sprinting track scholarship. <laughs> For those of you in the Christian vernacular, he's not done with me yet. She's off payroll, she's right there. It ain't about you, boo. <laughs> it's foul. <laughs> who you are is who you are. If you can't be who you are, where you are, you change where you are, not who you are. Who you are is who you are. If you cannot be who you are, where you are, you change where, you are, not who you are. I work for a small startup in Minneapolis, and <laughs> it's up and coming. You're going to hear about it soon. And um, my job is not to diversify the workforce. My job is not to create inclusion, my job is not about creating a happy place for the world and, and doing the right thing and driving a moral imperative. My job is to help Target make money. We're a for-profit organization. If you didn't know that, John is gonna be really upset that you're in this program. <laughs> and so if 75% of the US sits within 10 miles of a Target store and is one click away from Target.com, then our obligation to make sure that what we offer in products and services and messaging and experiences looks like what they need in order to get what 21st century philosopher Cardi B calls shmoney. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a student of hip hop. Um, then we lose. So I don't need y'all to come work at Target if you're planning to come in there and be vanilla, pun intended. Yep. Good morning. 
I don't need you. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with vanilla people. Let me be really clear. But the goal of diversity and inclusion is not homogeneity. So I don't have any problem with homogeneity. I've met my goals. I just need more of the other stuff. So if you're going through experiences like what you're doing with MLT, agnostic of if you work at my startup or not, and John is doing the work, the life work, of telling companies that they will not be around if they are not looking at people like you as critical parts of their workforce, and you have all of this to who you are, and when you walk in the organization that has said, yes, we agree, and you leave everything that makes you you at the door, don't take the job. You're killing my business case, you're hurting what John's trying to do, and you will not be able to help companies make money. Now, I'm not naive and believe that that's going to be easy. I'm not naive. What I'm asking you to do is be intentional. Because with your size and with your influence, if you refuse to go somewhere where they don't let you bring who you are with what you have to contribute, if you stop going, they'll start making room for you. If you compromise that when you walk in the door, then they'll continue to believe they don't need to make it right. Who you are is who you are. If you can't be who you are, where you are. You change where you are, not who you are. Now that's cute, Caroline, right? Yeah, you've been at Target 14 years. That's cute, you're a VP, that's cute. Sound guys, am I doing this or is it y'all? Okay, there we go. This is a really busy slide intentionally because I'm gonna give it to you later so you can use it for homework. But the idea of who you are coming into the workplace is not happenstance, it's not serendipitous, it's strategic. So what we're gonna talk about is what I call a architecture for authenticity. It isn't the architecture for authenticity. Take from it what's helpful for you, throw away what's not, just don't pretend like you already know all of it. Because none of us got to where we are with everything that just we know. There's hopefully one thing in here that's helpful for you. And by the way, just so you know, because I've heard that some of you went to, are going and have been and are at schools like Harvard and all these other places that are not Texas College where I went, what I want to assure those of you who are the brightest and best of the intellectuals is this did not come from a Harvard Business Review. This did not come from anywhere. You will see no citation because the citation standing in front of you. This is just my story. And when I, when I wrote it a couple years ago, you guys don't do this, I do. You know, um, PowerPoints are corporate comfort food. <laughs> like if you put it on a PowerPoint, people just feel better, <laughs> even if it's nonsense. But you can say great stuff, but if it ain't in a deck, they don't want it, y'all know. You'll see, if you don't know, you're gonna know. So, 21st century philosopher, Biggie Small. So anyway, so, I, I, I had this idea and I was putting it on there and I went into PowerPoint and I had a PowerPoint that somebody else had presented in another meeting but I liked the format so I took her words off and put mine and I was like, yes! And then it was like way too red and way too khaki because that was the format and I'm like, this ain't Target's plan, this is my plan. I was having this, like, this whole civil rights movement on my own. <laughs> like Target wouldn't try to screw me but I was acting like I was you know, oppressed because it was a red and khaki deck and so, so my brother's a creative consultant so I was like, fix this! So because all little brothers are jerks to their big sisters, he made a walmart -y. but I ain't no punk. <laughs> so I still use it. Um, <laughs> I'm not a punk. I don't care to look walmart -y. shout out to you if you're here and employed by Bentonville, smart move. Um, so here's what this is. I'm gonna talk you through this and then I'm taking my seat. There's three components to what you see on this very busy slide. In the middle is what we're gonna talk about as who you are, how do you get in touch with who you are. I heard the theme today was something like turning pro. I heard y'all were doing suits and sneakers, so I tried to Wakandaize it. But the point is, <laughs> um, I got stuck, did you see me? I was like, I can't say Wakanda and not. Um, it just was like, my body was against me. Anyway, so, if you're talking about turning pro, and that's what y'all gonna spend time here doing, then where I'm from, when you're an athlete, usually there's this thing called natural talent that happens somewhere in whatever spiritual realm you believe. Consider the middle of this to be about understanding what your natural talent is so you go pro on the right sport. That's the middle, we'll talk about it. 
in the four corners are then what I call how you then come into the workplace. Now let's be really clear. There is strategy to how you come into the workplace. I'm not gonna share with you anything that's gonna blow your mind, but I am gonna share with you what I like to call sequencing. Because often we just come in out of order. And I'm just gonna share with you a perspective of once you know who you are, then how, what is the way in which you can sequence your entrance so that you and your authenticity can remain employed and not get what we call at Target your ultimate promotion to guest and the enrollment in the salary discontinuation program. And then on the outside, you don't want to be enrolled in that. That's not a good development program. You want to be nominated. On the side, you have, often we think about our own authenticity. We think about our own authenticity, and we think that our authenticity is the only authenticity that can exist unless somebody else's authenticity is authorized by us. Then it can exist with us, but the rest of y'all, your authenticity is not allowed to coexist, but you must accommodate mine. So on the side, what you see are what I call the guardrails for um, inclusion and empathy, the way I would think about these is the way in which you're going to have to learn to coexist in a world where authenticity is democratized, there is no violation of the law, policy, dignity, and respect, and you now have to work with people who you both are aligned to, but you're also not aligned to, but they ain't doing nothing to you, so you don't interpret it as discrimination and start to be your own worst enemy. Because you can have a boss, a tailor, a chef, a whatever, that believes something fundamentally different with you and coexist. We just don't teach people how to do that. So people walk around with like, my authenticity is your problem and you are not mine. And then we wonder why people don't give us what we need. Because it's only about us needing to feel included, right? Not coexisting with other people. So that's the three parts of this framework and then I am taking my seat. In the middle you have those things. Here's the first thing you need to know and nothing else. You were born with a purpose in this world. That purpose is yours only. The slot you're supposed to sit in is yours alone. If you don't go after it, nobody else can fit it and the world goes without. Sleep on that tonight. So this isn't about I gotta go get my little piece of the pie. The pie's there, your slice is cut, it's your job to get to it. Get out of victim mode. I'm not saying there's not variables that get in the way. I'm just saying that you're usually the first 10. <laughs> Seriously, the stories we make up in my head. Listen, I have been oppressed by people that didn't even know my name. <laughs> I have created, I told you I went into this whole activism thing with Target because I picked red and khaki slides. Like, they ain't gonna rule me. Fool, you picked up the dang PowerPoint. But the narrative that we start to tell ourselves based on that creates all these barriers that we blame on somebody else and we put them in the way or we didn't realize they weren't even real and if we kick through it's a freaking hologram. Who you are is who you are. There's a purpose you were born for in the world. You ought to live your life in indignant pursuit of that. You'll know when it's clicking, when stuff that you didn't have to work hard to think about becomes an epiphany to people and you worried if they heard what you said and that you came up with it on the toilet. Here's what I mean by that it'll just start to happen. Your natural gifting, your natural talent, the thing that differentiates an all-star from just a player, even though they practice the same as about what God gave one person versus the other. Now you can try to be a pro and not be in your natural talents. My bet is you'll probably do the best at a B. I don't know if B is your goal, it's not mine. Because the path to A is easier if I just accept what I'm good at, more importantly, accept what I'm not good at. That's the harder part, because we spend our time trying to mimic those we see who are successful and we think doing whatever they do is what will make us successful versus what are they doing that's in line with their natural talents, what are mine and how do I mimic being in line with my natural talents so that the path to what my purpose is and the potential and the reward that comes with that is much smoother because I have to work less hard. And then for the thing that I'm not good at, all I need to do is know how to mitigate the risk so it doesn't get in the way of what I wanna do so I can spend 90% of my time doing what I'm good at, 10% of my time making sure the other stuff doesn't get in the way. Don't know where to start? Pick five people in your life. One colleague at work that knows you really well, it doesn't matter if they like you, in fact, we prefer they don't. Number two, a really close family member who knows you really well. Number three, a really close friend. Number four, some sort of outlier relationship that knows you really well, and I'll give you an extra one for your grandma or somebody who you just want to make you feel good. You just get to pick that one. And you're gonna ask them two really simple questions. You're gonna say, one, what is the thing that if it was the end of the world, I would want? You would want, sorry, if it was the end of the world, I am the person who you will not stop till you can find me because I am the only person who you want to do that because I'm the best at it. And then the other question, what is the thing where for the last two people on earth and you were dependent on me for this thing, you still wouldn't ask, you'd rather die? That's a hard one to ask, but accept the answer. 
because they're telling you where you don't need to bother trying to be the best. And all you're looking for is what is the theme across these people who know you differently that are showing your natural talents? My, t my friends would tell you creativity, they'd be like, Caroline, you laugh hard, you're funny. I think I'm funny. They, they'll be like, you're creative, like you're the person I want to talk to when I got to do a vacation, or I got to do a big special project. I'm not calling your behind when I want to build the itinerary. <laughs> I'm not calling you when I actually want to sit through and think through 17,000 miles of details. Because you don't operate in details. You're free. I'm organic, not organized. I'm informal, not incompetent. Don't be, get it twisted. <laughs> in there, you'll find out what are your natural giftings, and my only ask for you is to listen to what you hear. After you do that, which is where you become the hub and the wheel, not the job, and therefore your hub determines where the spoke goes, which is the other way around, then you go into this audacious agenda. When you start to understand what your purpose is, even if you're just going after it, you start to have the unmitigated gall to believe in a future other people can't see. And it doesn't matter if they can see it, because it's yours. If they can see it, it doesn't matter. They don't know what it is and they can't fit in it. So stop worrying about what they think about it. You'll know yours. You guys know when your intuition is talking to you, whether it's your goosebumps or you get jumped, you guys know. You'll start to feel that when you go in dignant pursuit of your purpose. And when you start to go in indignant pursuit of your purpose, you start to see things other people can't see. And then you have the gall to believe in them, agnostic of they do. And then you just go about going to get them while everybody else gets to be a spectator. And whenever they catch on, welcome them. Audacious agenda. Go after the maximum of what it could do. And then the third piece in the middle, this is all about you, I ain't even talking about the workplace, is my favorite, which is listening to the voice of dissent. I also call that courageous listening. Here's the thing. There is always going to be a group of people that have no idea what you're doing, nor want you to be successful. Stop acting like you're surprised when you see them. You usually knew who they were before. You just wanted them to say it. That's ego. The point is, if you can listen to the people who want you to be successful the least without responding and debating, they will tell you where you are weak, you will have the information you need to build risk mitigation strategies, so when it hits, Teflon. Or D plus Christian, breastplate of righteousness. Whichever one works for you. <laughs> if you can be quiet, because it doesn't matter whether or not they think you can do it, and listen, because they're gonna be the most truthful because they care not about your feelings, and write down what they're saying and take that into study and build the risk mitigation plan, then when it happens, you're sealed. Keep it moving. Who cares if they know that you think that they know that, you don't, that they don't like you? And who cares? You don't need to debate with them about whether or not they like you and should like you because of what you're going to do. That's wasted energy. They ain't never gonna like you. Why are you trying to make them? You're pursuing your purpose, you know your agenda, and if you can listen to the voice of dissent and build a risk mitigation plan, you're insulated. My mom. God bless her, Pamela Wonga. She is the Kenyan version of Emily Post. She's like Queen Elizabeth and Miriam Makeba at the same time. If you don't know that, Google it. Generation's not sure. I got promoted vice president, and my mom was like, I said, Mom, I got promoted vice president. Ah, Carol! Eh. <laughs> I'm so proud of you. You are the third most famous Kenyan in all of America. First is Barack, and then Lupita, and then you, eh! I call you Auntie Mary. I go tell her you be vice president in Kenya, I can die. <laughs> Thanks, Ma. Don't you love people like that that just hype you up? I would have walked into Target like, guess what, I resign. <laughs> There's more in store for me. And you need people like that. But you also need people like my dad. And this is what I mean about courageous listening. So my father, Lucas Wonga, who calls me a concession stand Kenyan, even though I'm not from the tribe that runs marathons, topic for another day. What is this vice? You are nobody's vice. You are a president. <laughs> Come on, man, can I have a day? Our CEO's name is Brian Connell. Who is this Brian Connell? I call him. <laughs> Does he know who you are? Does he know who I am? Who is he? You are a president. <laughs> My dad was dissatisfied. I was aiming too low. Gotta love parents. But the spirit of my father was this, your agenda is greater than what's in front of you. And what my dad would say is, be really clear on what you are born to do and the purpose you're there to get and the audacious agenda that's there because if you're not clear about that, you'll, set, you'll settle for what's available. And yes, CEO of a Fortune 
50 company that makes $70 billion a year to my dad was settling. But if you know what you were born to do, then the limits of what's available don't become the limits of what's possible for you. Four ways to bring it into the workplace then. First of all, there's no diversity in the workplace if you're not in the workplace, which means on day one where you fill out your paperwork, whether you're new to the workforce or just in a new job, do not start sprinkling your authenticity on people until you've started your end of the contract. I'm not saying you don't come in and be who you are. I'm just saying that understand that they employed you and they've, they've committed to pay you before you've produced anything. So before you go sprinkling your authenticity on them and, and uh, welcome and orientation, fulfill the contract of the job. Your authenticity is you and it's there, but nobody will listen to it if you're not upholding your contract to be good at your job and in fact aim for great. The goal at the end of the day is to be great at your job, honor the contract. That way, when you come with some of the other stages I'm about to talk about, they can't use the fact that you're underperforming to undermine what they feel is uncomfortable. Y'all walk in sometimes, day one, well, not you, people that work at Target that are not in this room. <laughs> day two, I told my SVP yesterday that we need to have more stuff for dark-skinned women and she didn't tell me, y'all discriminatory, I quit. I'm sorry, who are you? How long have you worked here? Day two? I don't think she was discriminating against you. I think she just needs to know if you're a good buyer first. Can you do the fundamentals? You don't get to skip the fundamentals in place of your authenticity. You get to add your authenticity to the fundamentals because guess what? Everybody working there does the fundamentals. Your authenticity is your differentiator. That's your little bit of secret sauce that helps you win. But your foundation has to be good. Be good at your job. Then. This is intentional sequence. Relationship capital, John talks about social currency and social capital, all the same thing. Five spheres of relationship that are most important as you come into a new job, new company, whatever, new level in the same company. Five groups of people that are your focus for your first 12 months. Your boss, your boss's boss, your boss's peers, your peers, and your key business partners. Your boss, your boss's boss, your boss's peers, your peers, and your key business partners. You notice I didn't say mentor, sponsor, advocate, none of that. Why? Because those are not the people that determine how you're performing. Those are the people that help you get what you need based on how you're performing. So if you don't understand how those key stakeholders feel about how you're doing the first step, know whether or not you like where they are with you on that first step, and get those who aren't where you want them to be there for the first step, then when you start to sprinkle your authenticity, even if you're doing your job well, in those rooms you're not in, well, they'll talk about what they want to do with you next. You've got a bunch of people who just because they don't know what you do become a negative headwind against your advancement because neutral is sometimes as good as a no versus people that walk into a room and because you, are, you have strategery, they're surprised about how aligned they are and how you're performing and you sitting in the back sipping your tea like, I am so glad y'all are aligned. <laughs> and your job is to make sure that you know what they think about how you're performing, you're okay with it, and if you're not, you have a plan to get them there, and they are the people who you spend your time making sure they understand. It doesn't have to be this big overt thing, it's as simple as ask your boss's peer instead of your boss for an insight question one time. Make sure you're, you know how your peers would tell your boss you're doing because your boss is gonna ask them. When annual review comes or promotions come, those five entities are the voices that will determine how you're doing. And even if your boss doesn't want to promote you, even if your boss does want to promote you, if they say no, you're not getting promoted. Watch it. Mentors, all that sponsors are good. These are the people who get your anchoring down on the fact that you are valuable to the organization and you're delivering above expectations so that when you come with your law seasoning salt authenticity, they have no chance but to eat it, which is the next step in intrusive insights. This is the part where we start to bring all of who we are and our lived experience to work. This is the part where you go, I know exactly who I am. I do my job really well. The people who say that are singing my praises. Nobody can hate on me in closed doors because people will shut them down. And then you start to say, you know, I've been thinking about something. The fact that I can't buy foundation at Target even though I've worked here for 14 years, I think there's something wrong with our relationship. I would like to see if we can maybe just expand the colors. I could have said it when I started 14 years ago, but all of a sudden people came to the meeting and listened when I said it two years ago. The perspective is not different. It's just that I had the credibility, the capital I had performed, I'd honored the contract, and now they start to go, y'all better listen when Caroline say something. One, she knows a lot of people because she's done a lot of work and done great things, and so people listen to her. Number two, it's probably worth listening to because Caroline wouldn't bring anything that isn't about Target's mission of making money. She's, she's telling you that because she knows the operation and she thinks there's a business opportunity. We should listen. 
It doesn't mean every idea makes it. It means every idea gets listened to. And then we're talking about self-advocacy. This is the part where then you start to be the person who's answering questions about what do you want to do next. This is the part where they come to you and go, Caroline, you know, we think you're really valuable in the organization. We think you can do more. Here's three jobs we think you could do. Which one are you interested in? Most of y'all walk into the organization and are looking for how to get that first, right? How to get, I want somebody to shoulder tap me. Did, did you hear how much work went in before that shoulder tapping stage come? I'm not saying it has to be a long time, I'm saying it has to be an intentional sequence. And you're in charge of it. Raise your hand if you like potato salad. If you don't know what potato salad is, just play along, I'll explain it afterwards. Raise your hand. Put your hand down. Raise your hand if, if you see potato salad at a public function, the first question in your head is who made it? Raise it. <laughs> Again, those that don't understand this, we will do a cultural competency class right after this, I promise you. It's not that big of a deal, it's just a culture innuendo. Okay. So then raise your hand if after you find out who made the potato salad, you would be really careful about whether or not you'd eat it depending on whose name was said. You're, most of us are pickier about our potato salad than our job and where we work. We'll take anybody's money, any job, even though we know we'll contradict everything that we want to do, but we will starve if the right person didn't make the potato salad. <laughs> I'm so hungry, but Margaret, Margaret uses mustard, that's nasty. <laughs> so you just go work wherever, they ain't promoting you, they ain't doing nothing, but you just gonna be, okay. Calibrate. We're pickier about what we put on every day. We're pickier about who we're in relationships with. We're picky about all that, but we'll take whatever company's money gives us the most, even if we can't be ourselves there and contribute with all of who they are, which means we're, we're committing to performing at a C. Because you're never gonna be an A if you're in an environment that won't let you be your A. You're already an A, but they can make you a C. Settle for the C or go find the A so you can do other fun stuff with your life and build more of you. On the side of the guardrails, I'll go through them quickly, I'm gonna take my seat. In the middle, you know how to pursue who you are. Do it indignantly till you die. Don't ever stop. It gets funner once you start to see it. You get goosebumps and you start just being a social experiment for everybody else. Like Caroline Wanga, who wears African clothing, not because I just have style. I wear African clothing because I am Kenyan and there are people who I am their wildest dreams and my atonement for the opportunity to be in the US and be where I am is to represent their fabric, their business in this stage so I belong in this room as much as I belong in Kenya. This isn't accidental, it's intentional. This is out of respect for those that got me here. <laughs> know who you are, pursue it indignantly, follow the right sequence and how you bring it into organizations so you make them money but also contribute and then really understand how to be the right partner to the people you work with and live with by giving equitable opportunity for their authenticity to coexist with yours. You don't have to trade it off. And here's those guardrails, we use them at Target for other purposes. They're on the sides. You guys can have this slide, so don't worry about pictures or whatever. Yes, yeah, so and you can tell the Walmart people, I said it's their colors, I don't care. Okay, I, I know all of them. Ask, ask questions. Sit in the seat of inquiry a little bit longer than comfortable. You start to engage with somebody whose authenticity, components of authenticity, maybe you think conflict with yours. Instead of starting to build the story of the fact of how they discriminate you because they simply exist as a human being, sit in the seat of inquiry a little bit longer, ask questions. Ask the questions you want people to ask you when you want them to get to know you and not do that. Number two, Embrace all perspectives. Listening to perspectives from multiple people does not have to be an automatic change in your personal narrative. You still sit in the seat of choice. Let people share how, what they believe, agnostic of if you agree, and then decide if you want to engage, but that somebody disagreeing with you does not mean they're trying to change your personal narrative. That's within your control. Don't be a victim. Listen, you might learn something. Guess what? You also might not, and both are fine. Just don't make it a battle. Understand privilege, the word privilege is being used a lot in affiliation with white. I'm not in denial that that exists. I just think everybody has a privilege to give and a privilege to gain. Don't victimize yourself by believing you don't have any that you also bring to the table or that the person sitting across from you is it. It just might be a different one. Raise your hand if you walked on two feet into this room today. Put your hands down. Raise your hand if you can hear me saying raise your hand. Put your hands down. Raise your hand if you can see me. You've never thought about that as privilege, but think about your life if those three things weren't possible for you. Everybody has a privilege to give and a privilege to gain. The goal, reciprocity. Operate in the privilege you can give and find what other people have to give. 
Look for the privilege you need and let others ask for it from you. Accept and expect non-closure. Everything doesn't have to be a debate to agree and disagree, resolve and fix it and be right. Sometimes you can walk away from a dialogue or conversation interaction without closure. Let it sit. Everything don't have to be this big movement. Misery is optional is the next one I'm going to talk about. Sometimes it's worth it and sometimes it's not. You can have a heated conversation with somebody and let it be. I can't stand the people that come the next day and want to fix it. And I'm like, I'm fine, it's Tuesday. <laughs> like, your guilt trip is not my problem. We can just agree to disagree and we don't hate each other because of that. Then, assume positive intent, suspend judgment. Believe that their intent is good, even if you want to assign bad intent, just hold that thought for a second. To understand if that was their intent or if you just interpreted their behavior through that intent and they can at least tell you their intent even if you didn't like the behavior, you don't assign intent to them and decide that they are the most racist person on earth because they picked green plantains. Because <laughs> we do that, right? Girl, did you see the way that white lady looked at me when I was getting on the train? What if she's having a hard day, y'all? Is it about you, boo? Assume positive intent and suspend judgment till you've sat in the seat of inquiry a little bit longer, got an answer to your questions, heard all perspectives, and then decide if you want to accept and expect non-closure. Honor your truth and the truth of others. No, stereo no generalizing stereotyping in the same way you don't want to be the black woman that everybody asks about all black women. You don't want to be the token Asian. You don't want to be the Latino person that keeps getting asked if they speak Spanish or if they speak English. In the same way you don't want people to generalize, stereotype, assign characters to you without your input, give people the same room. Because they're white doesn't mean they're bad. And whatever else is in you that applies general stereotypes that you know you don't want, reciprocity. Listen courageously, I've talked about this. Voice of dissent, it's okay. Maintain psychological safety both for yourself and for others. If you see somebody not having a psychologically safe experience, be an ethical bystander, intercept, hey, so-and-so hasn't spoken yet, or hey, you okay, Alicia? Come on, let's go outside. But also maintain it for yourself. It goes with misery is optional. You have the power to leave any situation that isn't working for you. If you stay, you move from being a victim to it being a choice. Just know why you stay. Agree on the destination, negotiate the path to get there. Caden says a story about grilled cheese. I'm gonna tell it real quick. She hates the story and we still disagree on this. You about to see it. 17 years old she was at the time, in my house, that's an important part of the story. <laughs> she's had grilled cheese in her life. I come downstairs, she's got my toaster that usually sits like this, like this, with the slots like this, and there's two slices of bread and a slice of cheese in every slot with the toaster the wrong way, part of the story. And I remember saying something like, what, insert expletive, are you doing? And I remember the escalating anger I had about, you're gonna burn the house down, the neighborhood's gonna be the end, all of our ancestors are turning over. I made every reason <laughs> for why the way that she was using that toaster and making grilled cheese was wrong and must be rectified under my power and authority. <laughs> because you've had it, and I don't know why 17 years later you woke up and were like, this is how I'm gonna make grilled cheese. Because that's in my mind, that's how I remember her standing. She didn't stand like, but she looked like, anyway. <laughs> We didn't resolve it. We got, no, I don't even think we spoke the rest of that Saturday. Yeah, we didn't, see? There's no happy ending. Why do I tell you that story? The only problem with the way that Cadence was choosing to make grilled cheese was that it wasn't my way. She wasn't using the toaster my way and she wasn't making grilled cheese the way she had been taught for decades. <laughs> but if I really wanted to make grilled cheese my way, there was an iron, a George Foreman and several other tools a variable of my exposure and I could have sat next to Cadence and made grilled cheese my way while she did it the wrong way <laughs> and we would have both been satisfied with our grilled cheese. The moral of the story is there's many rights. What Cadence and I, what Caroline need to do, she wasn't right, but I have reflected on it and see some things I could have done differently. <laughs> the, to this day, this is like, we're taking this to the grave. <laughs> She's 23 and we're still hot about it. The reality is, what we needed to do was agree that grilled cheese is the goal, nourishment. And I didn't get to berate Cadence because she did it the wrong way. And the wrong way was only the wrong way because it wasn't my way. 
Instead, we could have both enjoyed grilled cheese on that fine Saturday morning in Minneapolis. If I would have just held my ego a little bit, don't write this down, I ain't really, this is for them, not for you. Uh, <laughs> if I would have just held my ego, my authority, and my power a little bit, and just went over in the corner and made grilled cheese my way, and been pissed, but let her make grilled cheese her way, we would have both been fine. Now, the good thing is she's her mama's daughter and did it again, and I was like, fine, whatever. You're gonna be gone in a couple weeks. Um, to college, by the way, I didn't put her out. Uh, balance, <laughs> sorry, clarity. Uh, to suspend judgment, assume positive intent. Uh, balance the practice with the passion. There's a difference between what you're passionate about and how your company chooses to do it. Decide to know what they do as much as what you want and differentiate the two. Their job is not to do everything you want. It is to do everything the company wants to do. There's a difference between the practice and the passion. Know it and know the difference. And then get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Understand how to sit in the seat of discomfort. It'll help you do failure recovery. It'll help you listen to the voice of dissent. It'll help you do courageous listening. It'll help you do all of that. And the last piece before I take my seat is inner work. Be in a constant state of self-reflection. I was listening to somebody the other day who said, I'm trying to figure out if I'm spending my life getting in other people's way or if they're getting in mine. And my answer was, most of the time, I'm the one in my own way. Know who you are, pursue it indignantly. It's the best journey ever. I live in liberation of it, just wish I'd have started sooner. Follow the right sequence when you come in to put your authenticity in the workplace so you get out of it what you need and they get out of it what they need. And then be really careful about making sure that you're managing and creating space for other people's authenticity to exist with yours as long as it's not a violation of the law, policy, dignity, and respect. I'm proud of you. This felt like a family reunion. I love this organization. I love y'all. Please go take over the world so I can return to Bora Bora and continue. <laughs> I've never been, but I'm a return. Um, <laughs> so I can go live my life. And thank you. Enjoy your day. <laughs>